Hi, this is Tom from ZeroToFinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through peripheral arterial disease. And you can find written notes on this topic at ZeroToFinals.com slash PAD or in the vascular surgery section of the Zero to Finals surgery book. So let's jump straight in. Peripheral arterial disease refers to the narrowing of arteries supplying the limbs and the periphery which reduces the blood supply to these areas. It usually refers to the lower limbs, resulting in symptoms of claudication. Intermittent claudication is a symptom of ischemia in a limb, which occurs during exertion and is relieved by rest. It's typically a crampy, achy pain that occurs in the calf, thigh or buttock muscles and is associated with muscle fatigue when walking beyond a certain intensity. Critical limb ischemia is the end stage of peripheral arterial disease, where there is an inadequate supply of blood to a limb to allow it to function normally at rest. The features are pain at rest, non-healing ulcers, and gangrene. There is a significant risk of losing the limb. Acute limb ischemia refers to a rapid onset of ischemia in a limb. Typically, this is due to a thrombus or a clot blocking the arterial supply of a distal limb, similar to a thrombus blocking a coronary artery in a myocardial infarction. Ischemia refers to inadequate oxygen supply to the tissues due to reduced blood supply. Necrosis refers to the death of tissue. Gangrene refers to the death of tissue specifically due to an inadequate blood supply. Let's talk about atherosclerosis. Athero refers to soft or porridge-like and sclerosis refers to hardening. Atherosclerosis is a combination of atheromas, which are fatty deposits in the artery walls, and sclerosis, which is the process of hardening or stiffening of the blood vessel walls. Atherosclerosis affects the medium and large arteries. It's caused by chronic inflammation and activation of the immune system in the artery wall. Lipids are deposited in the artery wall, followed by the development of fibrous, atheromatous plaques. These plaques cause stiffening of the artery walls leading to hypertension or raised blood pressure and strain on the heart whilst it tries to pump blood against increased resistance. The plaques also cause stenosis leading to reduced blood flow, for example in angina, and they can lead to plaque rupture resulting in a thrombus that can block a distal vessel and cause ischemia, for example in acute coronary syndrome. Let's talk about the risk factors for atherosclerosis. It's important to break the risk factors down into modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. We can do nothing about the non-modifiable risk factors, but we can do something about the modifiable ones. The non-modifiable risk factors for atherosclerosis are older age, family history, and being male. The modifiable risk factors are smoking, alcohol consumption, a poor diet, which is high in sugar and trans fat, and low in fruit, vegetables, and omega-3s, a sedentary lifestyle with little exercise, obesity, poor sleep, and increased stress. Let's talk about medical comorbidities. Medical comorbidities increase the risk of atherosclerosis and should be carefully managed to minimize the risk. And these include diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, and the use of atypical antipsychotic medications, for example in schizophrenia. 
A Tom tip for you. Think about the risk factors when you're taking a history from someone with suspected atherosclerotic disease, such as someone presenting with intermittent claudication. Ask about their exercise, diet, past medical history, family history, occupation, smoking, alcohol intake and medications. This will help you perform well in exams and when you're presenting to seniors as you'll be able to classify them as high risk or low risk for having the condition that you're suspecting. There are several end results of atherosclerosis and these include angina, myocardial infarction, transient ischemic attacks, strokes, peripheral arterial disease and chronic mesenteric ischemia. Let's talk in more detail about intermittent claudication. Peripheral arterial disease presents with intermittent claudication. Patients may describe a crampy type pain that predictably occurs after walking a certain distance. After stopping and resting, the pain will disappear. The most common location is the calf muscles, but it can also affect the thighs and buttocks. Next, let's talk about critical limb ischemia. The features of critical limb ischemia can be remembered with the six P's mnemonic. And these six P's are pain, pallor, pulseless, paralysis, paresthesia, which is an abnormal sensation or pins and needles, and finally, perishingly cold. Critical limb ischemia typically causes a burning pain, and this pain can be worse at night time when the legs are raised up on the bed, as gravity no longer helps to pull blood into the foot. Next, let's talk about a very specific syndrome called Lariche syndrome. Lariche syndrome occurs with occlusion in the distal aorta or proximal common iliac artery. And there's a triad of thigh or buttock claudication, absent femoral pulses, and male impotence. So if you see this triad in your exams, think of Lariche syndrome. Next, let's talk about the signs of peripheral arterial disease on examination. You can look for the risk factors for peripheral arterial disease, such as tar staining on the fingers, which can indicate smoking, and xanthomata, which are yellow cholesterol deposits on the skin, indicating hyperlipidemia. You can look for signs of existing cardiovascular disease, such as missing limbs or digits after previous amputations for critical limb ischemia, midline stenotomy scar which can indicate a previous coronary artery bypass graft, a scar on the inner calf for saphenous vein harvesting which may indicate a previous coronary artery bypass graft, and focal weakness which may suggest a previous stroke. The peripheral pulses may be weak on palpation. Palpable pulses throughout the body are the radial, brachial, carotid, abdominal aorta, femoral, popliteal behind the knee, posterior tibial and dorsalis pedis pulses. A handheld Doppler can be used to accurately assess the pulses when they're difficult to palpate. The signs of arterial disease on inspection are skin pallor, cyanosis, dependent rubor, which is a deep red colour when the limb is lower than the rest of the body, muscle wasting, hair loss, ulcers, poor wound healing, and gangrene, which is the breakdown of skin and a dark red or black change in coloration. On examination, there may be reduced skin temperature, reduced sensation to the skin, a prolonged capillary refill time of more than two seconds, 
and changes during Berger's test. Let's talk in more detail about Berger's test. Berger's test is used to assess for peripheral arterial disease in the leg. There are two parts to the test. The first part involves lying the patient on their back, or supine, lifting the patient's legs to an angle of 45 degrees at the hip, one at a time, holding them in that position at 45 degrees for one to two minutes, looking for pallor in the leg. If the leg goes pale, this indicates the arterial supply is not adequate to overcome gravity, and this suggests peripheral arterial disease. Berger's angle refers to the angle at which the legs turn pale due to an inadequate blood supply. For example, a Berger's angle of 30 degrees means that when the leg is held at 30 degrees, it goes pale. The second part of the test involves sitting the patients with their legs hanging over the side of the bed. Blood will flow back into the legs assisted by gravity. In a healthy patient, the legs will remain a normal pink colour. In a patient with peripheral arterial disease, they will go blue initially as the ischemic tissue deoxygenates the blood and then a dark red after a short time due to vasodilation in response to the waste products of anaerobic respiration. The dark red colour is referred to as rubor. Next let's talk about leg ulcers. Leg ulcers indicate the skin and tissues are struggling to heal due to an impaired blood flow. Some features help you distinguish between arterial and venous ulcers. Arterial ulcers are caused by ischemia secondary to an inadequate blood supply. Typically, arterial ulcers are smaller than venous ulcers, deeper than venous ulcers, have well-defined borders, which gives them a punched out appearance, occur more peripherally, for example on the toes, have reduced bleeding and are painful. Venous ulcers are caused by impaired drainage and the pooling of blood in the legs. Typically, venous ulcers occur after a minor injury to the leg. They're larger than arterial ulcers they're more superficial than arterial ulcers. They have an irregular, gently sloping border. They affect the gaiter area of the leg, which is from the mid-calf down to the ankle. They're less painful than arterial ulcers and they occur with other signs of chronic venous insufficiency. For example, hemosiderin staining and venous eczema. Next let's talk about the investigations for peripheral arterial disease and these include an ankle brachial pressure index or ABPI, duplex ultrasound which is an ultrasound scan that shows the speed and volume of blood flow and angiography which can be a CT or MRI angiogram and this involves using contrast to highlight the arterial circulation. Let's talk in more detail about the Ankle Brachial Pressure Index. The Ankle Brachial Pressure Index, or ABPI, is the ratio of the systolic blood pressure in the ankle around the lower calf compared with the systolic blood pressure in the arm. These readings are taken manually using a Doppler probe. For example, an ankle systolic blood pressure of 80 and an arm systolic blood pressure of 100 gives a ratio of 0 0.8, which is 80 divided by 100. The ankle brachial pressure index results can indicate the severity of peripheral arterial disease. A result of 0 0.9 to 1.3 is normal. 0 0.6 to 0 0.9 indicates mild peripheral arterial disease. A ratio of 0.3 to 0.6 indicates moderate to severe peripheral arterial disease and a ratio less than 0.3 indicates severe disease to critical ischemia. An ankle brachial pressure index above 1.3 can indicate calcification of the arteries, making them difficult to compress. This is more common in diabetic patients. 
let's talk about management of intermittent claudication symptoms. Lifestyle changes are required to manage modifiable risk factors, for example, stopping smoking. Patients also need optimal treatment of medical conditions such as hypertension and diabetes. Exercise training involves a structured and supervised program of regular walking to the point of near maximal claudication and pain, then resting and then repeating this exercise. And this helps to improve the blood flow to the peripheral tissues. Medical treatments involve atorvastatin 80 mg, clopidogrel 75 mg once a day, and aspirin can be used if clopidogrel is unsuitable, and a medication called naftadrofural oxalate, which is a 5-HT2 receptor antagonist that acts as a peripheral vasodilator, improving the blood flow to the peripheral tissues. Surgical options for intermittent claudication and peripheral arterial disease include endovascular angioplasty and stenting, endarterectomy, which involves cutting the vessel open and removing the atheromatous plaque, and bypass surgery, which involves using a graft to bypass the blockage. Endovascular angioplasty and stenting involves inserting a catheter through the arterial system under x-ray guidance and then at the point of the stenosis a balloon can be inflated to create space in the lumen of the vessel. A stent is inserted to keep the artery open. Endovascular treatments have lower risks but might not be suitable for more extensive disease. Let's talk about the management of critical limb ischemia. Patients with critical limb ischemia require urgent referral to the vascular team. They require analgesia to help manage the pain. Urgent revascularization can be achieved by endovascular angioplasty and stenting, endarterectomy, or bypass surgery. Amputation can be used to remove the limb if it's not possible to restore the blood supply. Finally, let's talk about the management of acute limb ischemia. Remember that acute limb ischemia refers to the rapid onset of ischemia in a limb, which is typically due to a thrombus blocking the arterial supply to a distal limb, similar to a thrombus blocking a coronary artery during a heart attack. Patients with acute limb ischemia need an urgent referral to the on-call vascular team for assessment and management. Management options for acute limb ischemia include endovascular thrombolysis, which involves inserting a catheter through the arterial system to apply thrombolysis directly into the clot. Endovascular thrombectomy, which involves inserting a catheter through the arterial system and removing the thrombus by aspiration or mechanical devices. Surgical thrombectomy, which involves cutting open the vessel and removing the thrombus. Endarterectomy, bypass surgery, or amputation of the limb if it's not possible to restore the blood supply. If you like this video, consider joining the Zero to Finals Patreon account, where you get early access to these videos before they appear on YouTube. You also get access to my comprehensive course on how to learn medicine and do well in medical exams, digital flashcards for rapidly testing the key facts you need for medical exams, early access to the Zero to Finals podcast episodes, and question podcasts which you can use to test your knowledge on the go. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.